All right, well, good morning. Uh, I hope that you had a chance to uh, participate in the pancake and bacon breakfast this morning because it was delicious. Uh, <laughs> so Deb Cordray and her team of elves put that together for us, and they did a great job. If it wasn't for them taking time out of their Christmas Eve to do that for us, we wouldn't have been able to do that. Uh, in the same way, we wouldn't be able to do the things that we do without the faithful and generous giving of our partners here at BCC. So whether you give in the drop boxes in the back or whether you give on the website, we want to say thank you because your gifts really do fuel our ministry. They fuel our mission to love our community and invite them into a life-changing relationship with Jesus. So thanks. Thank you for, for doing that. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Eric. I'm one of the ministers here, part of the teaching team. And uh, one thing about Christmas is every year, our family gets out our nativity scenes, and they're much like this one, right? But every year, I'm confused by them because I've never seen a nativity set without animals, which I don't think is all that historically accurate, but we roll with it, right? Because it's Christmas, and, and so we put the animals in there. But there's one thing that I know about animals because I've got a bunch at home. I have way too many pets, and wherever there's animals, there's always poop. <laughs> and there's never any poop in a nativity set. So that's why uh, I went back at uh, Nick's uh, PlayStation. I got a, a little uh, a poop to put in our nativity set <laughs> right there. Makes me feel better. Because <laughs> Christmas is confusing enough as it is, right? And, and if you don't believe me, go to Target right after a service today. Go to Target, look at the walls, and you'll see signs that say joy and hope and peace. And then look at the shoppers, <laughs> and you won't see any joy or any hope or any peace. We call it the brightest season of the year, and yet when I'm driving home at 5 o'clock, my headlights are on, because it's really the darkest season of the year. And I think that the reason that we have these kind of mixed messages around this season is that we know that this season can be really dark. We know that the season can be really heavy. We know that the season can be really cold. Today's a bad example, but we know that this is true about this season, and so we, we try to create all of this artificial light to kind of drown out that darkness so that we can, we can at least enjoy a little bit of this season, right? But just think about December 26th. When all the wrapping paper is thrown away and the lights come off of the tree, and you look at your calendar and you see, oh wait, there's three more months of winter left, and no Christmas to look forward to, just credit card bills. See, the artificial light doesn't do anything about the darkness, it just kind of covers it up for a while, but what's worse is that the artificial light also covers up the true light of Christmas. And, 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 and here's, here's what I mean by this. Today, we're going we're gonna to kind of talk about the difference between artificial light, kind of like a light bulb, right, and, and true light, kind of like a candle. And, and, and they're very, very different because the artificial light covers up the darkness, but it doesn't do anything about it. But fire changes everything that it touches. It's, it's like if I was going to participate in the dad joke contest, you know, what's the difference between a light bulb and a candle? A light bulb can light up the room, but a candle can burn it down. So, so, so just remember that when we light candles later on. Uh, be careful, all right? <laughs> Especially the kids, all right? Uh, those things are powerful. True light is powerful. But the artificial light covers up the darkness, but it also covers up the true light. And what I mean by that is go out into the countryside sometime and, and look up at the sky, and you'll see all of these stars, right? And you're like, where have these stars been all my life? I've never seen these things before. And it's because you live in a city that creates a lot of artificial light and doesn't allow us to see that true light that, that, that's there. And so in order for us to see that true light, we have to go to the place that's dark. And we don't want to go to the place that's dark, especially around Christmas time, for a couple of different reasons. The first reason is that the dark feels really familiar. The dark feels really close because we know that we participate in the darkness that's all around us. We are, are cruel sometimes. 
We hurt people's feelings sometimes. We create injustice. We, we, we don't do what we're supposed to do. We don't listen to our parents all of the time. So we participate in the darkness, and we don't like that part of ourselves, and so we don't want to go there. We're, we're afraid that it will overwhelm us, that it will consume us. That's the first reason. But the second reason is because in the darkness, you can see the true light. You can see that there's something that can do something about the darkness. There's something that can change the darkness, but you're afraid that it will change you because you are a part of the darkness. And, and here's, here's what I mean, mean by this. So there's, um, in, uh, we've, been, we've been going through a series on the book of Isaiah and, and looking at how Isaiah looks at the Christmas story hundreds of years before Christmas happened, right? And uh, in Isaiah, in Isaiah 6, there's a story where Isaiah the prophet is taken up in a vision into the throne room of God, into the fire of the true light, the fire of God's love and justice and mercy, and, and he's standing there, he, he knows that he's a part of the darkness, and he's afraid. He says, woe is me. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I come from a people of unclean lips. He says, I'm a part of the darkness, and here I am standing in the middle of the fire of God's presence. Woe is me. And so I think that when we stand in the darkness and we see the light, and we see that it can, it can do something about the darkness, we kind of get afraid that it might do something about us too. That in God's destruction of the darkness, of, of the sin, of the hurt, of the pain, of the injustice of this world, that we'll be caught up in that, and we will be exposed, and we will be destroyed. But the story that Isaiah tells over and over and over again throughout his book is that God is going to come, he's going to bring justice for the darkness, he's going to solve the problem of the darkness... But in doing that, he's also, he's also somehow going to preserve for himself a people who have been purified from their darkness and given a job to do. It's like, I, I don't know how that's even possible. I'm a part of the darkness. If, if I get in contact with the light, I'll be destroyed, right? But here's what Isaiah says in Isaiah 42. It's actually uh, Isaiah recording the words of God. And God says this, Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him, and he will bring forth justice to the nations. And so he's going to deal with that darkness, right? But he will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice but he's going to do it in such a way that a faintly burning wick won't be put out. He'll do it in such a way that a bruised reed won't be broken. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice on this earth. So he's, he's not going to stop until the darkness is dealt with. And the coastlands wait for his law. Thus says God, the Lord who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spreads out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. So he's going to send a servant, and this servant is somehow going to purify his people without destroying them. I will give you as a covenant for the people a light for the nations. They're going to be made a light for the nations to open the eyes that, that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. So God's going to send this servant and somehow it's going to purify the people of Israel. It's going to give them a job to be a light to the nations. Well, how is that possible? How could God be just? How could God destroy injustice and not destroy us at the same time? And the answer is Christmas. The answer is Matthew says that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. And Luke says that he is the Son of God. And John says he is the Word made flesh, made to dwell among us. 
And so what he does is he comes down as the, as the, as the pure light of God. And instead of destroying us, he lets the darkness destroy him. He takes the darkness upon himself by dying on the cross to purify us from our sins and then to give us a job. That's the story of Christmas. It's not that everything was peace and hope and joy. It's not that we can, we can uh, glaze over the darkness by putting posters on the wall. The darkness is still going to be there unless somebody deals with it. And the story of Christmas is that Jesus deals with it. He gets rid of it. He destroys it. The darkness cannot overcome him because he is the true light. And the true light changes everything that it touches. And so that's what we remember every week when we take communion. So if you've not gotten one of these, they should be in the back on the table back there. But we're going to take communion right now to remember what Jesus did for us on the cross. The first thing we do is we eat this bread. And this bread represents Jesus' body that was broken for us. So let us take and eat and remember. And then this juice represents his blood that was poured out for us to purify us, to make us whole. So let us drink and remember. Whenever we eat and drink, we remember Jesus' death on the cross and what it did for us. You see, the end of the story in Isaiah 6 where he's up in the throne room is that God sends an angel with a burning coal and he touches it to Isaiah's lips and you would think that it would destroy him, but it purifies him and gives him a job, right? In the same way, when we trust Jesus as our Savior, when we allow him to come into our lives, when in the darkness we cry out for the true light, knowing that it won't destroy us, but it will purify us and give us a job, Jesus is faithful to that promise. And the job that he gives us is to be a light to the nations, to be a light to everyone around us, to show them the love of Jesus, to stand in the darkness, not cover it over with an artificial light, but to burn with the fire of Jesus' love, of Jesus' presence in our lives in the dark corners of our community, of our family, of our school, of our workplace, to look for ways that we can promote justice and look for ways that we can extend mercy to those who need it the most. So let me ask you, what, what would it look like if you did that? If you became a candle burning with the love of Jesus in the dark corners of your life, of your neighborhood, of your community. What would that mean? What would that do to your neighborhood? Well, in just a second, we're going we're gonna to see kind of a, a physical demonstration of what that might look like, because fire changes everything that it touches, right? Fire attracts like artificial light cannot, right? We don't, we don't gather around a lamp but we will gather around a campfire, right? Fire spreads. And so when we stand as a candle of, of the light of Jesus, of the fire of Jesus in our community, what we'll see happen is that that light will spread throughout the community and it will change everything that it touches. We say here all the time that with Jesus better is possible, so if we take Jesus to those dark corners, better is possible. There's a better life available. There's a better community. There's a better purpose for us if we would just step into that purpose. And so that's the, that's the challenge. Will you stand as a light in the midst of the darkness? Will you look for ways that you can, can uh, seek out the dark, the, the tensions maybe in your family, the conflict that's there? And speak life and truth into those dark corners? Will you find the person at, at school that sits alone at lunchtime and sit next to them? 
and say, hey, look, there's somebody that cares about you. I care about you. I want to sit next to you. What will you do to be a light in those places? Today's a, a special day. Um, one of our, our students has decided to be baptized, to, to stand up and say, listen, I want to burn with the love of Jesus where I'm at. I want to make Jesus my king. I want to submit my life to him. And so in just a minute, Molly's going to come out here. She's going she's to say that she believes in Jesus. She's going to be dunked under the water. She's going to participate in his death and burial and resurrection. And then what we're going to do is she's going to light a candle off of the, the Christ candle right here. And then we're going to spread that light throughout this place. And as we see that fire kind of pass from one person to another, uh, we, we will see what a, a physical demonstration of what it might look like if we stood as a candle in the dark corners of this world. If we stood like Jesus stood in the darkness to bring hope and peace and joy and love and the true light of God's justice and the true light of God's mercy. And so as you see that light spread throughout this room, just think about what you can do in your neighborhood with the people that live next door to you, with the people that work next to you on a daily basis, what you could do to speak the, the love of Jesus into their lives, what you can do to shine like a candle, like Molly's about to, to shine like a candle for all of us to see that says, I follow Jesus, the true light of the world. I'll turn it over to you guys. Well, Molly came to Brady and I several months ago asking um, to be baptized. And she said her heart was ready for God and that she wanted to be with him forever. Um, but she also said she wanted her family to be here. And that's very important to her. And there are about 25, 30 people here today um, to walk along Molly in your journey. And Jesus didn't say it was going to be easy said it's better with him and so we will encourage you as you walk along i would like you to repeat after me i believe i believe that jesus is the christ that jesus is the christ the son of the living god the son of the living god and i choose him and i choose him as my lord and savior as my lord and savior and i will now baptize you for the confession of your sin in the name of the father the son the holy spirit and for your forgiveness of sin and the gift of eternal life